we want to shift from the paradigm of the Anthropocene to the paradigm of the Symbiocene. But if that's all it is, we'd probably just be waiting impatiently for the next paradigm after that. I see the Symbiocene as having uh, a lot of grunt, a lot of clout. It has scientific validation as a result. Once we're on the Symbiocene, I don't think we need to get off. I think we're on a path that is capable of perpetuation indefinitely into the future, which is one of the definitions that we tried to get up and running for sustainability. Glenn A. Albrecht is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine, and sponsored by the Alohas Regenerative Foundation. Glenn is an honorary associate in the School of Geosciences, the University of Sydney, New South Wales, Australia. He retired as a professor of sustainability Walter Murdoch University in mid-2014. He continues to work as an environmental philosopher and published a book, Earth Emotions. I have it right here. It's one of my favorite uh, books. It's in my book bag everywhere I go, and it's right in an arm's length reach uh, here in my studio. It was published in French and Spanish in 2020 and in Dutch this year, 2024, in numerous publications and public talks over the last two decades, Dr. Albrecht has developed the theme of psychoterratic uh, psych earth or negative and positive emotional states connected to the state of the earth. New concepts, <clears throat> new concepts developed by him are now becoming well established in the international scholarly literature, new research thesis and inspiration for many creative people in the arts and music. I'm one of them. I use uh, the book and the concepts and philosophies in my talks. I speak about Glenn quite a bit. He is best known for creating the concepts of nostalgia or the lived experience of negative environmental change. His most recent work develops the mega meme of, of the symbiocene a future state where humans reintegrate with the rest of nature. A book of that title should be com completed by the end of 2024, The Symbiocene. He currently lives at Blackheath on the Gun Gundungura land in the Blue Mountains of NSW, Australia. The, the Symbiocene, your next book, uh, has this kind of subtitle which says, our only future. Glenn, welcome to the show. Thank you for being here. It's a sheer pleasure and honor. I'm so glad you're here. Welcome. Thank you, Mark. And it's uh, reciprocal because I admire greatly the work that you do. And it's an honor for me to be part of what it is that you do as a professional uh, for our only future as well. I, I, I think uh, we're very closely aligned. I, I could go on with your bio for a long time. You sent me it's more like a CV of the places you've lectured, your universities, your uh, studies and things. Um, how how did you get on this path? How how did it occur that uh, you became a philosopher and kind of went on this path through sustainability and connections to these terms? How did you arrive uh, where you are today? Well, I think I, I grew up as a nature boy, so that's the the, the bottom line, if you like, that uh, uh, where I grew up in Perth in Western Australia, it's uh, one of the most isolated capital cities in the world. It also happens to be a biodiversity hotspot. So if you grow up in Perth, you you grow up in a uh, in a state of endemophilia, one of my, my words, uh, the endemic flora and fauna of southwest western australia is 
is noted throughout the whole world. And so you grow up in a place which is unique, distinctive in, in, in the true sense of the word, and you begin to appreciate just how different Western Australia is to the, even the rest of Australia. You're isolated. And I was also very fortunate to have uh, a grandmother and a mother who were both nature lovers, particularly focused on plants. And for whatever reason, I was focused on birds right from almost infancy. So I write in Earth Emotions that I ran away from home as a toddler to go and visit an old couple down the road who had a sulphur-crested cockatoo in a cage that could talk. And so it was quite clear to me that I was uh, away with the birds very early in life. And I wanted to become an ornithologist, and that was my main goal in life uh, to complete s standard school and went and go to university, study zoology and major in ornithology. But various things in my life, particularly uh, the, the, the tragic loss of my father uh, when I was 16, put me on a path that was more philosophical. So it was out with the birds and uh, in, into ontology and epistemology. And it was because also as a teenager and young adult, I was on that path that many of us go through, which is the search for meaning. And I could see that my bird-loving nature and my love of nature in general was not going to go away. But I'm now 71, so I was at university in the early 70s, and uh, I was certainly as a high school student participating in the counterculture of the, the 1960s as well. And so the, the pressing concerns for a young man at that time were not birds, they were the Vietnam War, they were the bomb, they were the, the beginnings of the clear felling of forests, uh, the conversion of our hardwood forests in Southwest WA that I love so much into toilet paper and tissues. And so the competition between uh, the pulls and pushes of life and my calling for birds was so overwhelming that I ended up studying philosophy rather than ornithology. I ended up uh, doing a PhD in philosophy. And as an academic, I've always taught applied philosophy in environmental courses. I've taught ethics in uh, biomedical courses. And just generally, I've I've worked as an applied philosopher in the environmental domain, culminating in that my last position in a university was the professor of sustainability at Walter Murdoch University in Perth. And I stress Walter Murdoch University because uh, Murdoch University could be misinterpreted. Great. I, I really appreciate you mentioning that. And with, with your academic background and teaching as a professor, what did you see uh, or notice that is maybe lacking or missing in uh, this eco-literacy world or this sustainability? I mean, uh, it, in to today's world, we're hearing um, a bunch of different things. We're hearing coal and fossil fuel companies using the word sustainable, sustainable coal and, and things like that. So it's almost... I hate to say it, a little bit of a bastardization of, of some certain meanings. And and then the students, they, they're they overwhelmed. They think that sustainability is kind of an add-on to something in life. So what, what did you see and how how did you combat that with your teachings and, and, and uh, what what did you come to? Did that also influence you coming to the book as well? It, it certainly did, Mark, because... Uh, teaching sustainability, uh, particularly to environmental science and environmental management students, they, they wanted a really uh, concrete, coherent uh, account of what sustainability meant. And of course, I did my very best as an academic to provide them with definitions and with uh, material as, uh, as foundational to it. But all the way through, I was aware that sustainability wasn't being defined adequately because it has no content. Uh, until you give it content, until you actually define what it is that you wish to sustain, it can be applied to virtually anything on the earth. And so it didn't take very long for those that, who are technically not sustainable to twig that a concept 
that has no definition or content, it could be applied to anything, could be used to greenwash or whatever word you want to use their own activities in a way that just says, well, okay, I can use the word because sustainability doesn't mean anything in particular. And the same applied to many other concepts. The big one, of course, is environment. Uh, we use the word without thinking. So uh, we don't have an environment. We actually live within nature or life. And so we, we use these key words, key concepts in a way that uh, is easy. It's almost like they're spray on words. We can use them and feel happy, but they actually don't convey any important information. So as a teacher, I realized that despite my best efforts, sustainability, for example, became lost in, in a miasma of public relations and spin. And that didn't surprise me. And I guess as a linguist as well, I can see that just about any word can be misused and abused. So it's not unusual for language to be to be lost. But there is another element to this, which is that the world to which our language applies are changing so rapidly that I, I came to the belief that the existing language, the existing literature was impoverished with respect to our actual feelings, the way our feelings and the what, the way the world is being presented to us were falling apart. They were moving apart. And so I realized that there was a need to really carefully conceptualize the relationship between uh, human health and uh, ecosystem health, for example, and that the existing language that we were using was inadequate to particularly focus on the mental health aspects of that relationship. And so I thought uh, back in 2003 when I created the concept of solastalgia that in particular the English language or languages based on mainly Greek and Latin were impoverished with respect to saying something meaningful about this relationship between human health and ecosystem health, uh, our, uh, our physical health and our psychic or emotional health. So having been interested in that relationship as a teacher and as an academic, I've, I had to retire in order to pursue it further because you don't get brownie points for transdisciplinary thinking in the modern university. You uh, You have to actually go out on a limb and start thinking about how do these multiple domains come together in some kind of meaningful context? And uh, as a thinker and as someone interested in meaning and language, uh, as a philosopher, I started to create new concepts which I thought more adequately described what was going on. Or if there's something going on and there's no language for it at all, uh, that indicates this massive gap that's uh, occurred between the state of the world and the our psychic and emotional states. And so I set about making good that gap or or that uh, missing link, if you like. And that's what I've been doing for the last 20 years, is continuing to work in a domain which I call the psycho so psycho of the mind, teratic of the earth. Even that word is now becoming well used, and uh, I've discovered that... Uh, uh, through a, a uh, Google alert that people, particularly academics, are using that word all the time. But it's the symbiocene and positive earth emotions, negative earth emotions that I keep working on because that's the domain that lacks the adequate language for us to understand the predicament that we put ourselves in. And that when I say our ourselves, I'm not referring to the whole world. I'm referring in particular to... Uh, that part of humanity which has uh, alienated itself from the rest of life and perhaps from the rest of humanity as well, where we're no longer uh, seeing life as something which we are connected to or part of, but something to get rid of so that we can just kind of keep bulldozing our humanity all the way through Earth and then into outer space. And so that's the Anthropocene concept that I'm I, I compare and contrast everything that I'm doing now to to the uh, to the features of the Anthropocene. So that's pretty much a summary of how I started to create concepts, particularly because the English language 
is totally impoverished with respect to the distress that humans feel as a result of the breakdown of their normal relationship to their loved home or support uh, ecology, environment. I, I have different words for the environment as well. So I, th I think it was that realisation that set me on this path. Uh, I'm still on it. There's work to be done. Uh, I think there's uh, now a lot of other, there are many more people engaging in this pursuit of the psychotyratic. And I have to say there is one other reason why I continue to do it with further, and that is that most of the other approaches, particularly those that involve, uh, um, I, I guess, the, the pursuit of knowledge through science and the dissemination of that knowledge in scientific journals and hopefully through the media as well, but we're seeing the failure of information where we've got science and objective knowledge being presented to us about, for example, uh, climate chaos and the crisis we're in there, but nothing's changing. And so I've thought that more information, more facts uh, are not likely to succeed after 20 or 30 years of this bombardment of facts. Uh, humans are emotional beings and maybe, just maybe, uh, approaching some of these problems through the lens of the emotions through the landscape of the emotions could be more effective, or at least it needs to be tried, than what we've done up until now. Uh, and so I put that as another reason why uh, there's a need for word creation, concept creation, particularly in the domain of the human hyphen nature relationship. That's absolutely beautiful, and I'm glad you you uh, expressed it as such because that's exactly what I kind of wanted to point out and go even even deeper. Even though you've take, given us a pretty good view, in the subtitle of your book it says "New Words for a New World," uh, which I think is really fitting. You mentioned the Anthropocene. Um, we're we're in this this trap or this kind of area that well, it's very anthropocentric thinking vocabulary grammar how bad humans are uh, acting on the earth and and uh there's not a lot of hope emotions or optimism of where we're going it seems like we're really stuck and and struggling to get out of this anthropocene uh, not only terminology but world that we're in that's just getting it's diving deeper and that brings up this, you know, the, the term Anthropocene is, it's not new, but I've heard some others besides the Symbiocene from you. I've heard from uh, James Lovelock. He came up with the Novocene, and that mm. was his one of his last books. And um, then I uh, have heard the Sustainocene. Um, that that was from a professor out of Japan, uh, and I, I've, uh, his name fails me now and um there there's numerous things like that popping up and i'm totally in in alignment we need new words for a new world and and come up with this in in your book and and other things online we've we've exchanged back and forth and you you kind of say this this meme of the symbioseme and what does when you say this meme and this terminology and this comparison to these other types of scenes, you know, the, the uh, sustaino scene, the Nova scene and, and that, mm -hmm. uh, how did that all develop and why is that so important? Can you go a little bit deeper and explain that to us? Sure. The, my reaction to the Anthropocene, I mean, Critzen and Sturmer created that concept in the year 2000. It filtered through uh, the scientific circles. It was being debated by the geologists and the geomorpho geomorphologists. Uh, they, they didn't come to a conclusion, but the Anthropocene as a concept was hugely successful in that it ac accurately described the state of the play between humans and the rest of the Earth. We were dominant. We were bulldozing. We were despotic. And we were not likely to stop at any time soon. And so the Anthropocene struck me as sort of like a blow to the stomach, or I described it in my book as a sudden onset of food poisoning. I wanted it out of me as soon as possible. And the, the reason for that was that I realized it was entirely accurate, a description of 
the period that we're in. This dominance of humans over nature has a long history, and you can go back to biblical times and scripture to get despotic readings of the relationship between humans and the rest of life. But from the 1950s onwards, you know, I, I date the start of the Anthropocene at my birthday, the 5th of March, 1953. That's when the Anthropocene started. And the, the point I make is that my, I was born into this era. I didn't choose it. I grew up in it. I began to think about it as a, as a teenager and as a young adult, but then as a mature philosopher, thinker, I realized that it was an accurate description of where we'd gone wrong as a species within the matrix of life on this amazing planet. And so when I started thinking about, well, what is it that I dislike so much about the Anthropocene? And it wasn't just the fact that humans were dominating. It was that we were separating ourselves from the rest of life. And I think most people accept that uh, that is a characteristic of how Anthropocene. We, our thinking tends to be anthropocentric, which is focused on humans and humans only. And that if you wanted a conceptual explanation for why humans have gone wrong, you know, the Americans would say, you know, took a took the wrong turn at Albuquerque or something like that. Uh, the anthropocentric thinking of the Anthropocene is a good place to start, particularly if you're a critical thinker. And then I had the the insight or the moment of thought where I, I think, well, what's the solution to the Anthropocene? And I thought, well, it's, it's, it's exact opposite. Everything you can think of in the Anthropocene, think of its opposite, and you begin to get some idea of uh, a future that is viable, worth living in, worth handing over to your children and your grandchildren, etc. a source of hope. Uh, and then it occurred to me that the foundation of life as I understand it, is symbiosis. Symbiosis as a factor in evolution is at least as important as Darwinian struggle and competition, and Lynn Margulis in particular made that clear and famous in the 20th century and early 21st century. And so symbiosis as the foundation for life became the, the core of the, the paradigm or meme of the symbiocene. So I wanted a future reference so that we could hold up to particularly young people on the planet right now in all languages the idea that life doesn't have to be a continuation of the despotic Anthropocene. We can actually imagine a much better future. It's so exciting, so interesting, so beautiful that uh, once we start to think about it, we never want to get out of that mode of thinking. Once we start to think about it, we realize that there's huge amounts of creative work to be done to make this transition from anthropocentric thinking to symbiocentric thinking. Everything has its opposite. And so the extractive economy versus the symbiotic economy, it doesn't matter where you wish to start this process of reversal and op opposites. It's almost like a game, you know. Give me, a, give me a concept in the Anthropocene, and I'll give you its opposite. And guess what? The opposite is sustainable, technically. And guess what? It's resilient, technically. Guess what? It's capable of being regenerated accurately. Instead of the language being uh, abused and misused, we use the symbiocene as a paradigm to correct the mistakes that, are, you know, they're not always mistakes conducted by people. Some of them are deliberate abuse of concepts in order to further their own narrow, self-interested, individualistic uh, thinking. And so the symbiocene, to me, is a way of getting out of a prison or a cage. We put ourselves in it using language. We, we keep ourselves in it using language. And guess what? We can get out of it using language as well. Yeah, I, you really take my breath away with the way you describe that so eloquently. And um, where does the the meme part come in and how do we understand that? You know, we hear um, people making these memes on regeneration, on sustainability, on the environment. 
Uh, what does that mean in, under the guise of the symbiocene and its importance? Do, do we want to make it a meme? Do we want to push it out there and, and talk about it and get this new way of thinking? Well, well, it's a really good question, Mark, because I was thinking about this and talking about it with some colleagues today, this afternoon in Australia. Uh, the concept of a meme was created by Richard Dawkins in his book, The Selfish Gene. So the gene as a symbol of selfishness and its extension, but not necessarily by Dawkins himself, but by various acolytes and others into the idea that, uh, well, it ends up in the greed is good paradigm, the greed is good mentality, because if our genes are selfish and evolution is in a sense selfish because of competition, nature red in tooth and claw, you know the story as well as anyone. Uh, we, we had a perfect scientific explanation for our selfishness and a perfect scientific justification for an economic and political system which was based on competition, ruthlessness, uh, advantage. And so we, we, we almost had it all sewn up. But at the back of the book, Dawkins starts saying, well, look, if this is what we're like genetically, it may not turn out to be a good ending. Uh, we are also powerful uh, culturally. And so he said, well, uh, we can culturally shift from the determinism of our genes. And in a brilliant move, he created the concept of a meme. So it's a cultural replicator, not a genetic replicator. And so he both described our, uh, our late Anthropocene perfectly, and uh, Anne Rand and many others, I think, captured the economic and political consequences of that selfishness expressed in our economics and our politics. Dawkins gave us the idea of a meme to uh, as a kind of uh, life lifeline. He's saying, look, we are genetically like this, but it doesn't have to end this way. We can culturally evolve and that our cultural evolution is a powerful factor in our, uh, our evolution as a species. And he left it at that. So the idea of a meme has been taken up by thousands of people as just a cultural replicator. However, I see the symbiocene as a cultural replicator trying to oppose the very essence of the anthrop Anthropocene. So, okay, we've now rejected, or the geologists have rejected, the formal posting of the Anthropocene as a geological era. Uh, as the Americans would say, it's an error. <laughs> Uh, in English, meaning a mistake. Uh, we can't we can't have it as a geological era. However, it is now a meme. It's not even a, you know a, in the contest for a, a, a ge any kind of geological status. So it's a battle of the memes. Uh, I see the symbiocene as backed up foundationally by symbiotic science. I see that science is exploding in interest and in exploding in discoveries in the late 20th century, early 21st century. So much so that I think uh, uh, bioscience is now dominated by symbiosis and uh, the discoveries we're making on things like uh, the gut microbiome and the mycelium networks of fungi it's it's now headline news and so what i'm saying is that okay if if it's a battle of memes let's start with memes but let's move on towards paradigms because that uh, shift in paradigms is more like a a uh, as thomas kuhn the philosopher of science but the structure of scientific revolutions and the idea of paradigm shifts I think it's describing what we want. We want to shift from the paradigm of the Anthropocene to the paradigm of the Symbiocene. But if that's all it is, we'd probably just be waiting impatiently for the next paradigm after that. I see the Symbiocene as having uh, a lot of grunt, a lot of clout. It has scientific validation. As a result, once we're on the Symbiocene, I don't think we need to get off. I think we're on a path that is capable of perpetuation 
indefinitely into the future, which is one of the definitions that we tried to get up and running for sustainability. So, yes, meme is not adequate. Uh, paradigm's not adequate. Uh, way of life. Uh, I, I don't think there's any one word that will describe it, but the reason for me using that language is to just get us out of the idea that we're somehow fixed and that there's only one direction we're going in. And, I mean, I, I make the contrast slightly differently by using two different spellings of the word utopia. The Anthropocene is a utopia because, as per Thomas More, it's a state in the future we can never reach because it's so internally contradictory and self-destructive that if we try and project it into the future, there's nothing there. Well, there may well be, but it's not us. Whereas, and that's utopia with one U, and topia means place. So it's no place is the precise translation. Put an EU in front of topia, and what does it mean? It means good place. And that's the idea of the symbiocene is a good place in the future towards which we wish to go. And so it is a utopia, but not the one that uh, uh, most people think of. Uh, I didn't create that particular uh, spelling, but I thought it's a beautiful use of the language to highlight the contrast between what I'm on about uh, and and the Anthropocene or the, the, the captains of the Anthropocene, if you can put it that way. And so I've only been doing this for you know the the symbiocene's been around since two thousand and eleven as a thought you know a thought bubble. I've been gradually working on it. I've been gradually convincing other people that it's a idea that's got weight, it's got legs, it's got imagination, it's got energy. It's even quite enjoyable when you start thinking about it uh, and that's what's been missing in a lot of the the literature and uh, and the and the the de depressing uh, I, I guess you'd call it uh, dystopian, uh, but very successful uh, academic, literary, film. We're bombarded with the dystopia. Uh, everybody likes looking at the car accident. Nobody wants to, uh, you know, nobody's going to write a bestseller telling us about how sweet the birds are chirping and how the children are singing. So I'm, I'm, I'm going against the grain. I'm but I'm trying to turn that around as well. And I notice that people like you are not using the words hopium and things like that. I think you you genuinely see a possible future for humanity, which is far better than the one that we're being projected into by a tiny minority of humans on this planet. And so I put my effort into this positive, uh, enjoyable, uh, visioning of a future that's worth living in. I'm also a father and a grandfather, so there's that standard. Look, I'm a human being. I want, I want my children and grandchildren to have a, a good life in a good world. But I'm also the kind of human being that thinks that all children should be moving into such a world, and, and that uh, the uh, symbiocene is one way that I can contribute to that movement. Uh, and right now, I agree with you, it's not looking good, but I don't think that's a reason to give up. I think that's a reason to work harder. Absolutely. You brought up several areas I want to touch upon. So you mentioned Lynn Margulis and you, uh, you mentioned Dawkins. Um, you even tickled upon Darwin's uh, uh, idea of uh, natural selection, survival of the fittest. So I truly believe, and there's even this controversy tw uh, between uh, Dawkins and Lynn Margulis. They had uh, some very heated debates back in the day. Uh, she basically turned the scientific community on its head. You know, she's a, the rebel female scientist, and she said, you know, we've misunderstood what what Darwin meant with natural selection, survival of the fittest, severe competition, and, and on and on. That's not how the world has ever worked. Uh, the way the world works is in symbiosis and cooperation and collaboration. And uh, so I heard 
those positive words, but also it resonated and it was emotional for me uh, um, to understand the connection that that that's truly how how the world works. And we see some. Um, you mentioned it even earlier, kind of the yin and yang that there's, you know, you can say how bad the Anthropocene is and I can give you the counter of the symbiocene where there's resilience and regeneration and positive things or the other side of it. That's a very optimistic or hopeful outlook uh, of a future. And with, with that whole, uh, the, that whole understanding that I was talking about, there's a bunch of other ties um, to that way of thinking. Not only, uh, and I always try to say it this way, uh, Carl Sagan was Lynn Margulis's first husband, <laughs> instead mm -hmm. of saying that, you know, she was his first wife uh, type of thing. And he talked about the cosmos and that we're all star stuff and the basic elements of life are carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, calcium, and 90% and of the human body makeup is those basic elements that make up the, the substance of our earth. Uh, so we're tied to that earth. So it's not just earth emotions. I feel that symbiotic and symbiont connection to the earth and my health is a direct reflection of the health of the earth and vice versa. Mm -hmm. um, and and so I, I I see those things and when when I show the present my presentations and have talked about your book it's always right next to Lynn Margulis's book and she has many publications and books but I always hold up the one that talks about uh, symbiosis as an ecological phenomenon that's the fastest form of human evolutionary innovation our world has ever seen. Um, uh, and, and, and that goes to this this concept of of symbiosis and all living systems that we're a living system, but ecology, environment, living system, biology, one plus one never ever ever equals two. It's mm -hmm. a super exponential. It goes into quantum tunneling. David Bohm, quantum uh, physicist, was a friend of. Uh, Einstein's or colleague of Einstein's talked about that in wholeness and the expletive order and the, uh, 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 and and those things and so what I'm what I'm saying is there's this movement uh, and, and this form of unlearning that we're reaching that you know the way we understood the world of this natural selection survival of the fittest it's really not how the world's ever worked and. How can we go into this symbiocene type of thinking and that? And not only did you bring these people up, but I see behind you, you've got patterning instincts from uh, Jeremy Lent. That, uh, his other great book is The Web of Meaning. And I'm sure Lynn Margulis's books, maybe Fritz Hof Capra, uh, somewhere you're collecting this knowledge as well. You're probably friends with some of these these people. But there's this kind of a shift in consciousness. And Carl Sagan said it great. He said, you know, there's this, there's this growing consciousness that sees the earth as a single organism and an, an organism divided amongst itself is doomed. And so I kind of want to go into now, besides Dawkins, besides Lynn Margulis, where is all this coming together? How did you find this? Do you believe it is uh, some kind of a download? Do you believe it's... Uh, spiritual or or, uh, or some kind of a consciousness in, in that respect how how at this point in time is it coming to that why is it so vital to get this information out and how how do we combat that with this uh overwhelming thing uh thing in in some respects this woo woo feeling you know if you talk about something connected to star stuff or connected mm -hmm. to the earth people think you're a tree hugger a hippie or kind of crazy but in reality it's just the way the world works and so i kind of want to see how that merged all together for me or where your influences are and how you combat that uh, you know when people even forget about the word earth, they just see emotions. They think you're trying to, you know, meditate with them or do something mm. else. And so that's kind of where I want to go a little deeper. 
Well, that's, there's a lot there, Mark. So I'll, I'll try and tease out the bits that make sense in some kind of logical order. But uh, good emotions and good science go together. That's one of the quickest ways I can answer the end question, which is that why should we think that emotions are somehow uh, separate from the way that we interact with the earth and other life forms, other humans, these interactions take place uh, through evolution. They've, they've taken place cumulatively over 3.5 billion years. It'd be very strange if somehow our emotions weren't connected to life, life processes and uh, survival. Uh, another way of thinking about that is to, to build on the conundrum. Uh, yes, there are life-affirming emotions. There are necrophilic emotions you know the people that seem to actually like death as opposed to the uh, sexual perversion so Eric Fromm and people like that talking about that that aspect of our, our personalities our characters our mentalities so you know so it's a kind of Hobbesian problem uh, if humans were really nasty bastards uh, you know if we ate our babies and and did it did terrible harm to each other as as the norm, we would have gone out of existence within a few thousand years of our, our, uh, our arrival, as it were. So it's quite clear that our not only our survival, but our flourishing as a species, I mean, let's just take numbers as a, as a good indicator that we've done well as a species. There's over 8 billion of us now. That's an indication that these positive emotions have had a significant uh, role in our success as a species. Uh, someone like Wim, uh, Bill Rees would say that, you know, that it's probably also the cause of our demise that we just keep breeding and uh, we're not interested in the, uh, the, the limits imposed by nature on human wants and needs. But at, at the very basic level, it says to me that humans as a species, have been able to thrive largely through what I call terra nascent emotions. Earth, terra, earth, nascent, uh, connected to birth and, and regeneration, if you like, reproduction. Terra nascent emotions are those that support life in the earth. If we were terra forens, which are the opposites, the terra, the earth, foreign means destroyer. Uh, you know, if you're a phytophora in, in the plant world, you, you're a destroyer of plants. Uh, so this battle between these life-affirming forces and life-destroying forces are also part of the cosmos. Uh, you don't have to, you know, look for very long to see that there's smashing and bashing going on out there as well as great beauty in the order of the spheres. So... On Earth, it seems we have a particular set of circumstances that have allowed life to prevail and thrive and, and evolve over billions of years. Now, that to me is a truly remarkable thing and that we, as far as I know, we don't, we don't understand that there is life anywhere else in our immediate cosmos universe other than that which is on Earth. So life is really amazing and precious. We know it's animated by both competition and symbiosis or cooperation. The cooperative side of that uh, has always been understood at fairly large scale. And so we've even had people like Prince Kropotkin writing a book, Mutual Aid, in 1901. So it's not as if we've not had information about this, but getting back to Margulis and what we are discovering, and it's the act of discovery, we get new knowledge. We know, we can now know stuff on the basis of our extended senses, like we've got microscopes, we've got telescopes. But in particular, the microscope has given us an insight into the microcosmos, as, as Lynn called it. Now, the microcosmos has been known since the Dutch invented the microscope, um, the little animacules that they discovered in pond water and things like that. We've now added to that list of discoveries all the way through to understanding our gut microbiome, understanding the uh, the process of uh, 
of symbiosis through mycelium networks in forests, and we now understand uh, all sorts of things about symbiosis at the microscopic scale. And so to answer the beginning of your question, we've always had this tendency to look out at the big picture. It starts by looking into the church or maybe the biggest tree. Uh, obviously, the moon and the heavens are bigger than us, and that's a source of great inspiration, mysticism, symbolism, and now uh, solid scientific discovery. But we've never looked inside. In fact, it, it interests me that even with this knowledge of symbiosis at the micro scale, and that we, these great big animals walking around uh, solely uh, by courtesy of our gut bacteria, we don't appreciate that. So, you know, a lot of people talk about the more than human. Well, bloody humans are more than human and always have been and always will be, I hope. And so we need to reverse this outward looking. Uh, and it, it can be uh, large scale spirituality if you want it to be. I mean, the, the whole Gaia idea is a, a massive animistic cosmic model of uh, human life, Earth, and its connections to the rest of uh, the cosmos. However, I'm not sure if I want to go in that direction just at the moment. I, I'm spiritual in the sense that I've created a concept I call the Gedeist. And Ged is an ancient root word in, in our languages. It means to unite. And it's the root word for words like together, to gather, and importantly for me, the word good. So these g sounds that you get in these wonderful together type words all come from Ged. And if you add the, the, the Geist to it, which is the spirit, the, the vital spirit, the, uh, the idea of a Ged Geist is a spiritual understanding of the interconnections in life from the micro to the macro. I believe that in itself is spiritual. It's not just a scientific fact. It's something that humans can appreciate and understand as not only vital to, to their lives, but you know we, we flippantly talk about ecology as interconnection. Well, this puts you know some kind of uh, uh, concrete content on what the interconnection is. These things happen at micro level. We've got a trillion fellow uh, life forms enjoying the one life that we consider ourselves to be Glenn Albrecht or Mark Buckley. So this is in itself spiritually important. It arises out of new discoveries that humans have made through the extension of their senses via technologies such as electron microscopes. We never knew it was there before. We may have had an inkling that there was plenty to be influenced by that we couldn't see, and that obviously leads to various forms of animism and and uh, and, and thinking that we need to explain these things. But now that we've got a hard science, uh, bioscience, symbioscience, I think we can keep the animism because it's an important part of being human and understanding our connection to the rest of life. But instead of it being symbolic, it's now symbiotic. It's actually something that we can share uh, that understanding and the the foundation or the discoveries that helped us make those uh, this new understanding of the intimacies of life. And symbiosis is is the core of it. It's it's where the best knowledge that we have now resides. And so I'm not going to go into the uh, beyond the earth. I'm, I don't understand a single thing about quantum mechanics and nor do the physicists that profess it. <laughs> I'm being flippant there because they keep changing it. Uh, I, I noticed the, I read a paper the other day on the impossibility of black holes and the, the implications of that for quantum theory. So I do my best to keep up. But really, if you relied on physicists for the, over the last hundred years or so for insight into the nature of the universe, uh, you'd be you'd be disappointed. If you uh, relied on biology for insight into the way that life works, you wouldn't be disappointed. You'd, you, you'd find an amazing explosion of knowledge that we now have that we didn't have before. So symbiosis, you know, 
from German scientists in the 1870s, 1880s, looking at lichens, realizing that two plus two equals three. From then, you know, we've had an explosion of knowledge in this domain. I think we should probably and humbly acknowledge that that we humans have actually done a fantastic job of understanding something which was bloody hard to understand. You couldn't see it. You didn't know what it did. And until we made these discoveries, we couldn't then apply that knowledge to culture, politics, economics, or anything else. And so that's the end where, where I'd like to pause is that Yes, we've discovered this. Yes, there is symbiosis. Yes, we have wonderful people like Lynn Margulis that pointed it out to us and many others. But we haven't yet translated that knowledge into the, the, the other domains of what it means to be human. What we've done is allowed a, a symbiotic smashing system called the Anthropocene to keep going, smashing even more. I mean... Uh, it almost makes me want to weep into my red wine when I see what's happening to the Great Barrier Reef at the moment, one of the largest symbiotic structures known to us on the earth, and it's been bleached at 70% of it at the moment is severely, and uh, we just don't know whether it's going to recover from that 70% bleaching event. So there's symbiosis in crisis at a planetary scale, and that's the kind of scale and uh, that I... I think is about the limit of my my poor brain. Any bigger than that, uh, Lynn Margulis wrote about symbiotic planet. She and, uh, and uh, Lovelock wrote about Gaia as the symbiotic planet. But I think in the end, she uh, quite rightly pulled back from the idea of the animism of Gaia. She said it's it's a super self regulating organism. Uh, but it's not it's not the sort of thing that uh, Lovelock wrote about, you know, the revenge of Gaia, as if Gaia had yeah. some kind of uh, personality that uh, was going to wreak havoc on humans. And so that's where I am. I'm, I'm a hard-headed materialist. I love my science. I'm also an animist in the uh, in the goddeistual sense, you know. Uh, my invitation to those of you that wish to be spiritual is may the good dice be with you. And it arises strictly out of what we know about what it means to be alive, uh, what it means to be a hollow biont, you know, uh, multiple life forms coexisting in the same time and space, exactly as Margulis defined it. Most people, when they realize that they're a hollow biont, you know, they get the vapors and need to be um, helped up again because they've had the worst shock of their lives. We are not what we thought we were. We are not strictly individuals. We are multiple species coexisting. And so once we realize what humans are, we are more than human ourselves, we realize that we can extend this idea of life into the microcosmos. And of course, we can extend it the other way into the meso and macrocosmos. We've done well as a species uh, extracting the, uh, the meso and macro cosmos, the life forms, particularly trees and forests and all the fish, the loss of biodiversity is really a loss of symbiosis on the planet. It's the cumulative loss of symbiosis. The micro world, we've, we've even tried to stuff that up in various ways by for example, antibiotics, although life-saving and saved both my mother and my father, their lives from tuberculosis. Uh, so I, I, I take my hat off to antibiotics in, in that respect. But as symbiotic, uh, destroying uh, agents, their overuse in agriculture, for example, uh, causes massive problems. And so what what I'm diagnosing our problem is, uh, as a physician of life, is that we are in an economy, uh, in an ideology that either doesn't understand symbiosis or doesn't respect it. And if it does understand it and respect it, it's going to ignore that understanding and do what it's doing uh, despite. So it's, <clears throat> it's at the core of what's going wrong. <clears throat> and it's uh, at the core of how we can turn around from 
being despotic and extractive and parasitic. And Margulis was quite specific about we have to stop being a parasitic species and move into a new era where we're, uh, well, symbiotic species is, is pretty much where I would like to be. And, you know, if we've got time, we can talk about how to make that concrete. You know, we're now seeing creative people, scientists uh, and others all over the world beginning to see the opportunity of bringing human life and technology into harmony with the rest of life. But that's another long story. So I'll stop at this point and have a sip of water and then we can go yeah. again. Have that sip of water because I do want to take you just a little bit deeper into that same thought process and, and uh, maybe make sure uh, before we get on, how can we make that concrete and, and bring that out? Um, I, I want to maybe make sure I've uh, gone down uh, uh, an area fully. So as a linguist, as somebody who is uh, really deeply looking at new words for a new world and this, there's uh, there's frequency and resonance. So when when you and I have been talking, or when you you eat something good, you go hmm. Or if I agree with you, hmm. And if I disagree with you, hmm. You know, there's this frequency and we use hums as kind of beyond languages and cultures we can somehow show our agreeance and that you know um we're both a little bit older and so uh we've probably been through an mri machine a magnetic resonance Im imager and um <clears throat> so there's this thing with frequencies and resonance uh in, in our world that's also a form of language and uh uh, conveys emotions as well. H how does that fall into um, earth emotions, into the symbiocene, into things uh, that are beyond the spoken word? Is there anything that you've gone into that area at all and looked at and how, how that applies to different cultures and languages? Your book's now in three different languages and things. So how does that fall into play to what you've worked on? Look, I don't have any particular... Uh, well thought out views on resonance. Um, the one the one area that I like is Rupert Sheld Sheldrake's uh, morphic resonance, where I do feel at times uh, shapes uh, across time seem to turn up in ways that I find absolutely uh, bewildering and uh, and uh, inspirational in a sense that all of a sudden something will will come to me that uh, is from a past or something that I was anticipating and hoping that I would see, and it turns up. So I, I accept that those kinds of things are common. Uh, probably what I'm more sceptical about is the idea that resonance uh, in general is something that uh, we can say objectively that these uh, that resonance can be shared or passed or uh, it, it's uh, at grand scale and it must be the same at micro scale or vice versa. I'm just not sure. And so I remain uh, open to discoveries in those areas. I remain open to the idea that just as in biology and symbiosis, we make discoveries that just revolutionize the way we think. So I'd be foolish if I dismissed it as a possibility, as something which uh, could be just as revolutionary as the life-sharing symbiosis uh, discovery between different, unlike organisms. But at this stage of my life, I think I'm, my energy is going into the concrete. And I, I guess by concrete, I don't mean so hard-headed that I'm not willing to accept anything else. It's just that it's hard enough to get the idea of the value of life across without it going into uh, further domains that it's almost impossible to get agreement with among even a small group of human beings. At least now, symbiosis as a factor in evolution and life, you don't have to argue for that very strongly any longer. Uh, I think the the uh, the game's over there that we... Margulis won on symbiogenesis and Dawkins agreed that he was wrong. So let's move on. And I think yeah. the moving on is 
is the idea that we take the science of symbiosis as far as we can. And at the moment, we've got these hugely practical needs for shifting extractive, exploitative, parasitic uh, economic foundations and their technologies as rapidly as we can into something else. In, as I said earlier, they're opposites in, in, in the symbiotic sense. As for the can I can I just say something really quick? Yeah, sure. So, so um, I'm totally in agreement. I, I want to uh, finish that, and I, I want because you mentioned um, you mentioned that you you can, how do we get into the practical? How do we get could put it into practice? You would like to talk about that. I, I want to go there as well. I want to tell you the reason I I phrased the question or brought up resonance and frequency at all. So. Uh, I'll just make it real short. The reason I started the podcast five seasons ago uh, was because I went to speak to friends, family, colleagues, other people about these books, about these wonderful books that I had read that that uh, that resonated with me or that planted a question in my mind as I read them. I questioned other things. I wanted to understand them better. And so I was looking for other people who, who read them read those books to have a conversation with. And I have, I'm also an academic. I have a wide breadth of, of people that I should be able to speak to. The biggest problem I ran into is one, nobody had ever read these books. If they had the books, they says, oh yeah, I've got that book. And then I'd go to talk to them about it. And, and they says, that was in that book? Or I didn't read it. Or they, they say, yeah, it's still on my nightstand, but I didn't make it through but a couple pages and then fell asleep. And so I couldn't find anybody to talk to about these. So I said, I want to go straight to the authors. I want to ask them. One, that's tell me people aren't reading the books. And two, they're not asking the same questions that I, I, I wanted to. I wanted to know that. But when I read your book and when I read Lynn's books and when I, when I spoke to these others, it's not necessarily that I, that I understood them fully. It raised questions to me. But regardless, it resonated with me. There was almost this emotion, this feeling that I said, that makes sense. I understand it. Uh, it. This is the way the world works. I can't see the world in a different way because what's being written, what's being talked about, it's like it's almost like a no brainer. It's a form of for for my form of resonance. And mm -hmm. and that's kind of why I go in that because when when i show this show your book in my presentation and i talk about uh the symbiocene and and other things in your book and even in talk about lynn marvelous um just off of that little meme or that little slide that i do and with the few words that i say people don't go out i promise you the majority don't go out and buy the book and then go read it it resonates with them and they say that does make sense. It, it, we do need new words for a new world, and we need to get out of this anthropocentric terminology. And, and that's why I brought it up, because I think there is something in that, that there's, a, a, uh, and I'm far from the woo-woo, but there is this feeling, there's this, uh, the, the symbionts or the cells resonate with me, and my wife says, uh, that makes perfect sense, and 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 I I understand it. or I have more questions because I want to understand it better. Where can I go to find out more about that? And that that's really why I went down that. But it, it, it leads perfectly to where you want to take us anyway, is how, how do we get this into some kind of a practice or understand how we can shift to the symbiocene? Mm -hmm. I'll just pick up on a couple of the threads that you, you gave me uh, in what you just said. It's not that I'm opposed to resonance in a spiritual sense i guess what i what i would interpret and it's probably just a again a language issue uh what i'm hearing from you is life affirmation and we we have a life affirming life understanding uh knowledge base uh, epistemology that comes out of the the foundations of the symbiocene so there, there's something that we share which could more than adequately be described <clears throat> under the label of uh, the symbiocene. The other thing that I think we share, which is resonance, 
is transdisciplinary thinking because you seem to me to be the kind of person that transcends disciplinary boundaries. You see them not as uh, sacred barriers that must be uh, respected and uh, continually maintained. I think like me, you see them as uh, as barriers to our proper understanding of what it means to be alive as a human being in the year 2024 on this amazing place called the Earth. So what we've done really successfully is pull apart the resonance that held everything together. I think Indigenous people have understood that resonance, if I've got you uh, right, for you know, in Australia, tens of thousands of years, 80,000 years of continuous occupation of the Australian continent. So this this resonance is a, a, a form of harmony, uh, a, you could call it homeostasis. There are a whole lot of other words that you might want to use to say that bringing our human life into harmony with all life at micro to macro level is what the symbiocene is ultimately trying to do. Now, the past silo disciplines, the current university systems, uh, journal rankings, you name it, we've, we've created this elaborate system for keeping things apart and for awarding status and reward within those cages, these little prisons that we've erected for ourselves. Now, anybody who's capable of breaking out of those prisons, either voluntarily or out of sheer frustration of, of uh, how boring and how stultifying they are, I think is a person who has understood resonance. I just explained it in a different language. I mean, I used to write about complexity theory and transdisciplinary thinking uh, over 20 or 30 years ago, and I thought well, at the time, well, that, that has no resonance with anyone. It was a total failure in terms of uh, uh, trying to influence the world. I, I, I note now that it, there's a, a real return of transdisciplinary thinking and that uh, some of my early work may even be seen as uh, pioneering. You know, it was pretty good stuff, I thought, at the time. So what's the, again, the, the language, the resonance is something that I understand, but I don't wish to push it too far. In fact, I want to keep it within the atmosphere of the earth. Maybe uh, that's uh, a little bit too tough, but at the same time, I keep stressing the fact that the most amazing thing I know is life. Uh, it's the best thing, and uh, I'm going to keep keep focusing on that. And if we as transdisciplinary thinkers, as complexity theorists, uh, can share the excitement that I have about what this uh, amazing earth is capable of uh, producing and uh, you know, the, the biodiversity over the 3.5 billion years, but also us. It's us that's doing all the work understanding what's, what's gone wrong. Uh, we can also understand what's gone right. And so I tend to stick within those kinds of boundaries. It doesn't make them any less, but it doesn't make them more hard science. And if by resonance you mean the, uh, you know, these, the, this, uh, I, well, I don't know what you'd call it, the, the cage busting, the silo busting, the cutting across of uh, purely arbitrary and false uh, distinctions between one discipline and another, put, put the world back together again as a living entity. If that's resonance, then count me in. Great, that's super. How do we go to that the the next uh, progress of the journey into the future for the symbiocene? You mentioned uh, before you took your sip of water that you kind of want to get into. How do we put that into practice? How do we get it into the next right. level? Well, I, I'm seeing I'm seeing uh, progress in that domain. Uh, there's intellectual progress, which is obviously the uh, the realization, the, the legacy of uh, the early pioneers of symbiosis and people like Lynn Margulis, that we've now got the knowledge foundation that we were lacking in the 19th century. So there's there's intellectual progress and knowledge. Converting that knowledge into the opposite of how we've extracted from the earth, how we've burnt, exploded, done really dumb things. You know, we've been the 
right up there amongst the dumbest creatures that ever evolved on the planet. Our name is, uh, you know, it's supposed to be Homo sapiens, a wise ape. So what we have to do is live up to our own name. And we're seeing a few people use the science to now think about alternatives to the technologies that we're, uh, we're currently addicted to and f feel as if we, we can't get away from. And I've seen so many examples, even in this last year, particularly when I travelled to Holland or the Netherlands to promote, help promote the Dutch edition of my book. At the same time I was there, there's people uh, promoting the idea of uh, uh, mycelium-based coffins. You know, when, when you leave this world, you need to be able to be re returned to life as soon as possible. The idea that we burn our remains in, in furnaces all over the world in our millions because we all die uh, is one of the biggest you know, contributors to global warming on the planet. It's the fancy thinking that you know you, your car's the problem. It's actually your cremation that's the problem, uh, or at least is part of the problem. So Luke Biotech and people like Bob Hendricks in, uh, are seeing mycelium as working with life to further life, returning death, our corpse, to living systems as rapidly as possible, and hence the idea of a, you know, the traditional idea of a coffin was to kind of insulate yourself uh, as 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 much as possible, keep the elements or the uh, the remnants of life there uh, for as long as possible. And now we're beginning to think of the opposite. How do we return to the earth as rapidly as possible? You know, cheering as we go, as opposed to thinking that this is a, a really horrible thing. Uh, we're looking at algae and bacteria being used as the foundation for things like furniture. We're seeing uh, the current, well, I call them transition technologies, like photovoltaic cells and uh, lithium-ion batteries and wind turbines. They're actually the transition technologies for the energy of the uh, for, for future energy, which will come from bacteria, from algae. We'll be using life to produce what it is that we need, not uh, you know the rare earth elements and and all these other things that I think are a hell of a lot better than fossil fuels, and we need to use them urgently. But We've got to get away from the idea that we're just going to keep extracting at large scale in order to produce stuff that we need. Um, I work closely with practical people like architects. There's uh, PLP Architects in London, and they're building, or in their science labs, they're working on mycelium bricks. You know, So this is a prototype, laser printed, light as a feather, strong as an ox. That's going to be the building material of the future. So our steel and our concrete are a thing of the past already. We're actually seeing um, Myco Works uh, using mycelium-based bricks to build complete houses in places in Africa. And so fungi, bacteria, algae, the building blocks of life actually become once again the building blocks of uh, human life. And the amazing thing is that just about everything we can think of that we use can be converted from uh, petrochemical-based substances that are highly polluting, that are carbon dioxide maximizers, uh, to their opposites, which are entirely benign, have come from life and can be returned to life without any uh, so-called pollution. And so the idea of pollution is once again abolished from the dictionary. Uh, the idea that you can produce stuff that can't be decomposed is just, uh, you know, that, that becomes the norm. So in other words, we can actually begin to see how through our application of human intelligence, which is what Homo sapiens are supposed to do, to the problem of how do we live with the rest of life, we're beginning to see solutions to that. Uh, it's not a return to a very simplistic no-growth anti-growth past. It's actually be uh, ushering this in the symbiocene as one of the most rapid periods of, of change and growth in the history of humanity since the Industrial Revolution. That will be 
the next revolution, but it won't be industrial in the same sense. It won't be even the economy in the same sense. The politics are going to change as well. We haven't discussed that. We probably won't have time to, but I do raise all those issues in Earth Emotions that together with the emotional changes and the technological changes, there are going to have to be some major institutional changes as well. So it wouldn't surprise you when I say that I've created some biocracy, you know, a, a, a shift from anthropocentric demos, the people, crassy rule, to symbios, which is the root word in Greek for symbiosis. Uh, rule for the symbios is rule for all life and a consideration for all life. So, again, think of a characteristic of the Anthropocene, corrupt democracy. Well, think of its opposite. It's non-corruptible corruptible symbiocracy. So I don't want to make it all to sound as if, uh, yeah, we just have to get the scientists and tech, tech heads working flat out with their startups and their their crowdfunding, which is what Loop Biotech crowdfunded, I think, a couple of million euros in a week to get their mycelium coffin business up and running. Fantastic idea for a uh, for a business. You know, there's the, uh, the the need is never ending. I mean, you couldn't think of a better better business to be in. Uh, so I, I think it's the full range of what it is that humans are capable of or, and, and our characteristics and features, our mentalities, if you like, particularly our emotions. If we can get our emotions going in the right direction, you know, people nowadays talk a lot about purpose and the need for purpose and what they do. Well, here's the content for purpose because purpose is a bit like sustainability or resilience or regeneration if you don't define it it's like freedom freedom to do what you need to actually give it some kind of content for it to make sense well here here is the the paradigm the meme whatever you want to call it of the symbiocene which gives purpose uh, meaning uh, to what it is that a person can be committed to do in life and so I see that this is an opportunity for, you know, the tech heads and the engineers and the designers and architects. It's also an opportunity for the artists and the other creatives to get cracking on, uh, getting out of the, uh, the the misery of the Anthropocene and giving giving us some something to laugh at and to enjoy. Uh, really, that's what life used to be about. I think enjoyment. The French have a famous saying which uh, explains that so i th i think the focus on the practical is needed just so that people don't think i'm off with the fairies that somehow or another uh there's a, a good idea here but um, it has no cash value as some hard-headed economist might say it's not only got cash value it's got infinite potential to be developed further. And so I, when I'm talking to young people, I say it's got, uh, uh, you would never be bored in the symbiosis and there's always something to be done. It's always going to be creative, always going to be enjoyable and it can go on forever. And you'll be, it's another quick point I make is that like the having of children in the symbiosis is returning the proper sense of regeneration back back into into our human lives we want to regenerate we we need to have a a future in which uh, that whole regeneration process makes sense uh and also just on that concept because i know you talk a lot about regeneration i just want to go that little bit further than regeneration because that implies sticking with what you've got in many respects the feature of the symbiocene that i'd love to to finish on if if we're getting close to that is that it's endlessly creative it's going to produce new stuff that we can't even think about right now it's not going to regenerate anything that's on the earth right now it's going to come up with brand new ideas that are going to be so exciting we we won't know what to do with ourselves uh, and so it's not our critique of regeneration is to say yes we obviously we need that but we, as a species, are going to have to go just that little bit further. And surprisingly, I don't even have a word as yet for what goes beyond that point. 
I'll have to work on it. I'm sure you'll you'll come up with something and we we've talked before offline and that and you I mean you so nicely played so it's not just a, a new terminology new words for a new word it's a, a new operating system new uh some some democracy the form of uh beyond democracy be uh, something new that can uh govern and help us it's also new new economy uh terminology it's new ways of thinking doing being and uh, i believe that uh from the sheer word symbiosis it's uh has strong ties to regeneration obviously we spoke offline about uh composting late stage capitalism there's a book it's uh, got it here it's compost capitalism and uh samuel alexander um it's interesting and and we kind of uh, not only joked about it a little bit, I, I always, you know, say we need to uh, uh, compost. There's a lot of bullshit actors and a lot of bullshit in our wor world. And we really need good shit to, to, to get, get a nice compost going, a nice mm -hmm. mix of that, um, especially because we've had that biodiversity loss in our world. We don't have the, the guana and, and the 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 inputs to, to make a good compost always in many areas um but it's not just this metaphor of composting late stage capitalism and you said something that really resonated with me it really made me feel uh kind of looking at it in a different way than i've ever looked at even in the joking way that i sometimes tease about it you said uh that you agree that you know we should regenerate it and we can kind of compost it but that there's a lot of bad things we've done in the anthropocene like fossil fuels and chemicals and some very toxic things for our environment for human health that uh would really probably mess up our compost or mess up uh that process um and and it, it, i i kind of wanted to go a little bit deeper in that as well and also maybe push back and say, you know, in that mycelium, that mycorrhiza and that fungus, we've seen, I'm friends with Paul Stamets, we've seen oil spills with catastrophic oil spills that's hurt biodiversity being cleaned up by using fungus and, and different tools from the natural world. Um, I don't think it's probably always going to be possible on that, but uh, uh, the, the natural world uh, 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 is pretty amazing what can happen so I, I would just like to get more thoughts on that because mm -hmm. i know you've thought about this in depth and, and um are you're always trying to think far in, in advance and not just protect us but give us that you know is this very is this thought through have we really mm -hmm. do we really want to do that is this a good way to go so yeah well uh, i'm a strong supporter of uh composting gardening uh i'm an organic gardener have have been for many years so i'm not a, i'm not trying to criticize composting but i wanted just to alert us to the fact that the late uh, anthropocene or late capitalism let's hope uh is a pretty toxic beast and i think you're right we could use uh the best of our science to uh, develop biotechnologies that clean up some of that mess. But unfortunately, a lot of it is around for a hell of a long time. Uh, nuclear radiation for a start, the plasticocene, uh, that's coined because uh, a lot of the plastics uh, have an incredibly long life and are extremely difficult to biodegrade. And they're now part of the uh, the ecosystem from micro to macro level. I mean, you've probably read the recent discoveries of of uh, microplastics in uh, in human uh, male testicles uh it's in our uh, placentas it's in our lungs we're not going to be able mother's to mother's milk yeah. yeah it's everywhere yeah so there are some things that we can uh, cleanse for want of a better word but there are many things that we can't so the idea that we can just compost our past without rehab uh, is probably not thinking the problem through, as you you very uh, eloquently put it. the The idea that I have is, uh, you know, it's it's more speculation with respect to 
the symbiosin is that once we start doing our symbiotic reconnection to the rest of life, we will begin to do what life did before the Industrial Revolution, before perhaps even the Neolithic Agricultural Revolution, which is to produce nothing which can't be returned to the cycles of life. So at the bottom of Lake Crawford in Ontario, in about the year 2100, the scientists will go down and in the top layer of ooze, you know, it might only be a couple of centimetres thick, there'll be absolutely nothing that's not biodegradable. There'll be absolutely nothing in it that's permanently toxic to life, particularly um, human life, if we wish to have an anthropocentric view of our own future. So what I'm thinking is that that's the point at which the compost becomes truly uh, at one with uh, regenerating life on this earth. Um, so I don't want to scare people with the idea that the uh, their compost is somehow uh, undesirable. But, I mean, in Australia, we're, we're using uh, professionally produced compost on parks and gardens and it turns out that it's uh, contaminated with asbestos. And so we've now put mesophilia generating stuff into children's playgrounds and into gardens. I mean, it's, it's almost impossible to undo that, that damage. So the, the stop has to be the total system not producing, not using toxic materials. Uh, and having materials that can be returned to the earth in a in a healthy uh, and enjoyable way, particularly through things as wonderful as gardening as as uh, as enjoyable as permaculture and so it goes on. I talk about sumbio culture, which you probably would you would have guessed that I have a different view of agriculture <laughs> so the the idea that we can do this and then take our composting and our our uh, our shit and everything that really should be uh, incredibly uh, beneficial for the rest of the system within which we live i mean that's that's just foundational uh, people like uh, Hundert Busser, the amazing uh, Austrian uh, artist and designer, he he wrote a, a wonderful manifesto called Holy Shit, and it was the shit manifesto, and it was about the value of shit in the economy, in, in recycling, and how we've excluded it from our lives, particularly using, you know, our system of. Uh, of uh, sewage and sewage treatment, you know, he he said this is this is brown gold. This stuff we shouldn't be wasting it. We shouldn't be alienating ourselves from it. Uh, he said it, uh, it a, a good shit should it smells even better than the best perfume. And so he yeah. he's a, an amazing advocate for the, uh, just rethinking the whole idea of what what we've considered to be waste. So. Uh, I mean, I know some people think that uh, that shit is something that we should get rid of as soon as possible by pressing the button. Well, that's anthropocentric thinking. Uh, Hundertwasser would say, no, it's one of the most valuable resources we've got. Let's start thinking about how to reintegrate shit back into our lives. Uh, and that's changing the whole nature of the meaning of the word shit. Uh, there's also. It's funny because it's like we're yeah you know, we're we're now we're uh, talking shit, <laughs> but there's Pan Pantagonia came out with a, a movie just recently. Uh, it's called the Shitthropocene. Yep. The 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 uh, uh, the age of cheap shit is basically what what they call it, which which was really interesting. I don't I don't know if you saw that. Yeah, but, I did. I, so I've, the, I have commented on it. It's completely the wrong idea, you know. To, yeah. Uh, it's about as mistaken as a PR company could get, you know, the, to produce a film like that for a company that wants a different image. They should be sh celebrating shit uh, and then describing uh, what it is that they think is undesirable about the Anthropocene as not shit, but something worse, you know, not worse in uh, in, in that sense, but uh, something which is so horrible that it's, non uh, non biodegradable it's toxic it uh, it's not going to degrade for tens of thousands of years that's not shit that's the opposite of shit 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, and that, so, that's where the that's where we have these misunderstandings. We think, yeah, oh, okay, that it, it is sheep uh, shit. It's cheap crap. It's 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 this. But then when we think about, but no, sh shit actually produces good topsoil, good uh, compost. Uh, fertile microbial grounds and, and uh, is that i mean i you you know i do a lot with food and regenerative ag and organic ag as well and, yep. and you're ho hopefully going to contribute some things into menu b one of my books the the um the thing with cities villages countries as we we produce food we send it to cities metropolitan to grocery stores and people eat it and all the that the waste or the shit that comes out is not taken back and given back to the farms as nutrients. Whereas when we originally built up a, that it, it had a certain amount of return to the farms or to agriculture to give us those nutrients again. And so then it, it's perpetuated this chemicals and pesticides and fertilizers and all these other things because it was a one way cycle and, mm. and it didn't come back to the farms and, and there is a way to turn something that people don't like or even to talk about into something that is a brown gold or into something that we can use to regenerate and to have that symbiotic relationship again. And so I, I and that's, you know, that's one reason everything you've talked about so far we've discussed and in your book, you really help us to see, you know, what, the way we thought about it is really not how how we should look at it and we can put it in a different way and I'll also put it into practice to, to, to make that shift. And so I really thank you for that because it's, uh, well, I, it's important. I, I think it's an important thing to realize just how powerful and uh, what we call it an imprisoning force language can be just, we use words like crap and shit and in English, they now have very powerful meanings uh, conveying the idea that these are the things that we must avoid at all costs in life or, or that it's useless or that it's ugly or smelly or something like that. And yet, via Hundertwasser, I, 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 like him, would like to rehabilitate the words. Uh, and if they can't be rehabilitated, we'll have to come up with some new ones. But the point be being that we just so uh, casually use words without realizing that it stands for a whole way of life, a whole mentality, a whole paradigm. And if that's part of the paradigm we want to get rid of, then Patagonia makes the biggest mistake that it could possibly make in promoting its cause. So <clears throat> it's obvious that it's pretty easy to continue making those mistakes. And uh, if I can help get us out of those cages, out of the the conceptual mistakes that uh, seem to be uh, almost an automatic part of our current culture, then I'd be happy. So, uh, but I need I need help in this task. We need to point out these errors. <laughs> it's uh, it's urgent. Uh, I, I I will continue to help, and I'm sure that uh, many who watch this podcast and those who I've talked to you uh, about about your book and and your work uh, will also help the cause. There are so many people that have come up and just said, "Never heard that before. That's so beautiful, and it really makes sense." And um, and not everybody uh, has gone and read the book, but many have and, and really have come back and given me feedback to that and even started to apply it into their work um, through that. And I, and I really appreciate that for you. We're, we're not close to being done. I have a few a few more questions for you and no things problem. that, that I want to get into. My, <clears throat> Please go ahead. My 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 uh, podcasts are. I want to remove bias. I want to get into sense making. I want to go deep and and I I, I will um, uh, um, kind of kind of uh, get wrapping it up. But I want to ask you so so much more. And this is kind of not not really personal, but I think it's something that you you thought out, you figured it out for yourself and you write about it. And that's why I'm so excited that you're coming out with um, the Symbiocene book and, the, you know, our only future and, and 
can you tell us roughly how, what's our hope? I don't want to put pressure on you, but when can we can, when can we see that coming out? Uh, well, it, it it does put pressure on me because uh, I mean the act of creation is such an odd thing. Sometimes you can sit down and things just flow. Uh, other times life intervenes, like I've just, my wife and I have just moved from Wallaby Farm in the Hunter Valley to the Blue Mountains in New South Wales. So a complete change uh, in in our in our lives. And it's a, when you move, it's an upheaval. So I've cut my library in half. Yeah. And the, so that just puts a halt to my, my work. Uh, also, things just keep coming up, like the... The symbiocene idea is certainly, uh, you know, in Rostow's theories of economic uh, stages, it, it could be at the beginning of takeoff. And so I keep, you know, like I'm doing with you, I spend as much time as I can explaining this idea, the implications of it, because it's not just an idea, it's not just a word, there's a whole philosophy that goes with it. Uh, and then I... You know, I, I'm a committed activist in the sense that I go to climate uh, activist um, events. I do go to school strike for climate change. I go to uh, the blockades on the port of Newcastle where for a day we stop the coal ships and that sort of thing. So I'm not the kind of academic that just chains himself to a comfy chair inside a nice library. And never comes out until the book's finished. So I'm I'm seeing major diversions. Uh, so I was hoping to finish the book by the end of the year, which meant that by now I would have had a, a draft. So I've got bits of it drafted, and I want to uh, sort of up the ante and start working a lot harder and faster on it. So I'm still hoping by the end of the year I'll finish it but it may not be ready for the publisher. So it'll have to be okay. next year. So I'm disappointed that I'm not going to make this year unless something miraculous happens with my brain and my 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 finger typing, you know. I I used a pencil to write my bloody PhD. I'm not one of these, you know, typing at a million words a uh, a, a minute to uh, to get this thing complete. Also, even if I could type like that, my brain's really slow and probably slowing down as I age. So I just need to go at the same pace as my brain thinks. But I can tell you now that I'm highly motivated to finish because I can see if this is in takeoff phase and enough, we need to get about 20% of the world's population uh, it, just in Australia or Europe or, or North America interested in and committed to this idea for major change to begin to take place. Now, I don't have to tell you that I think the need, the urgent need for these changes is so great that I'm highly motivated to do my best to complete it. And uh, Earth Emotions has got, I devoted half the book to the symbiocene as a, a way out of the misery and the depression of the first half of the book, which was full of solastalgia and dread and and uh, all the other evil things that are going on and, and how our... How, positive emotions have been thwarted. And I even have a word, muicide, which is the extinction of our emotions, our good emotions. The culture is actually an emotion killer. We're being sort of hand-fed stuff that turns us into zombies. And so I, I can see the need to work hard and fast. I've now got some friends uh, in Australia and worldwide that seem to be uh, interested in taking some energy from the concept of the symbiocene and applying it to their domain, which is exactly what has to happen. I, I want it to, to, to fly out in every direction possible. That's the transdisciplinary thinker in me, the complexity thinker, and also the immensely practical person that I am. You know, I grow things, I, I repair things, I... You know, I like to think of myself as more than just a thinker. So, the the whole process needs to go into takeoff, and it's not done by me. It's done by tens of thousands of people that can see how to make this mega concept. Let's not call it a 
a meme or a paradigm. I, again, I might have to come up with a new word that describes uh, the philosophy of the symbiocene in a way that doesn't trivialise it or or turn it into some kind of expression of megalomania. Uh, I don't want to control anything. I, I don't sell anything except books, you know, and they're that's that's a choice that people can make but yeah the idea is it's free to enter and if it gets into enough really creative powerful intelligent human beings of of a multitude of ages it's not age specific i talk about generation s which is generation symbiote scene it includes old hippies like me and so, you know, there's plenty of scope for people yet to uh, to get into this this world in a very exciting, interesting way. So, that's the point that I'm uh, that I'm trying to make is that the uh, the work is fast and furious, as the the film was called. Uh, it doesn't have to be too furious, but there's an element of terror fury in me as well. I was asked to create that word by people that said, look. It's all very well being depressed and sad and solastalgic, but I'm effing angry. Haven't you got a word for that? So earth anger is my response. And even that seems to be taking off now. So I, I'm i keen for the language to inspire people. I'm keen for the positive earth emotions to take over from the negative. I'm keen and inspired by those that can apply their own intelligence to the application of this and you know like the uh uh i always forget how to pronounce his name peter uh naziski and his uh algae furniture people like that just totally blow me away because here's somebody who's an inventor and a creator could see what he was doing in conjunction with the idea of the symbiocene puts the two together and all of a sudden he's got something which no one else on earth is is doing. He's got a powerful meme to uh, to promote it, and uh, you know, journalists and and others the world over are interested in what he's doing. Same with PLP architects and the the other myco people, the the mycelium people. So I see that as hugely um, positive, but it's not. I'm not going to get carried away with it until we can see the twenty percent, and then. It's it's self sustaining, it's self maintaining. Then we're in it, and then I can order my mycelium coffin and die happily. There, there, you'll be glad to know, and you probably know it because you set up Google alerts and different things to be notified. But there are several symbi uh, symbiotic and symbiosis universities out there. There's mm. um, numerous, more than more than two dozen. Um, uh, companies that uh, have the terminology symbiosis in their name, but also in the practice of what they do. Yep. I try to work with with many of them, and um, so it's really a movement. There's really uh, a lot of people kind of re um, getting on board, resonating with that, and m moving in that direction. Also picking up uh, the tools that you've given, the terminology, grammar, and words. Um, the last and hardest major question I have for you today um, is is a 70 plus year old question. It's the question for specifically for you and your answer, not one for the bigger world or for Australia. It's just specifically for you. What does a world that works for everyone look like just for you, Glenn? Oh, it's the biggest question of the whole lot, isn't it? For me, it's a world where I can, it's not to replicate the feelings I had as a child growing up in Perth, where I felt at one with the world. I felt at one with the birds, the lizards. I had mentors that were able to help me in that joy that I got out of being part of life. So my mother and my grand grandmother in particular I mentioned. So we can't reverse the arrow of time. So what I would want is the mature, the aging, 
version of what I now call Uteria, a good earth feeling, the feeling of being at one with the earth that I was born into, that I have enjoyed living in, and that I will be able to depart with a sense of feeling uh, that I had a good life and that I've left, as they often say in the classics now, I left the world in a better state than what it was when I entered, or at the very least, no worse. Uh, because of the, the the bind that we're in now with this Anthropocene, Symbiocene, Terra Four and Terra, terra Nascent binaries, uh, I, I think it's uh, urgent that this transition is made. And so this, this world of my childhood in adult form is my attempt to say that we, we must creatively project a f ourselves into a future that has the very best elements of life in it and continue to hone and work on and nurture and further develop those very things that make life such an enjoyable thing to, to be part of. And so the joie de vie, I want it back. I want the, the innocence of my childhood, the UT area, to be a normal feeling, not one that's open only to mystics and people on drugs. You know, it's, it's, it's normal for people to have that feeling of uh, the joy of life. And so I think that's my long-winded answer to your most difficult question. That, that's so beautiful. And, and as we wrap up, was there anything that you felt we missed or didn't come out in our discussion or am I crazy questioning of you um, that you would like to share with us now as we, we close that uh, uh, is, is important for us to know? I have mentioned two of my neologisms that are positive. Uh, uh, endomophilia, the love of that which is local or endemic to your place, and just then UT area, that good earth feeling, that feeling of being at one, the uh, the perfect wave, you know, uh, the uh, the idea that uh, there is no uh, gap between the knower and the known. That's spiritual as well, and maybe that's getting back and closer to your concept of resonance. But building on our good earth emotions is what I think I would have liked to have said more about because the the Anthropocene is not only a sim, uh, symbiotic buster, it's a good earth emotion buster as well. It's breaking apart the very things that we uh, had as part of our human evolution. And so we didn't have to name a lot of our emotions, positive emotions in the past because they were freely available to us. They were, uh, we didn't have to search to find places to have them. Whereas now you've got a book in advance to, uh, you know, to go to your favorite place in the Bahamas or uh, forget about the uh, wilderness experience on the top of Mount Everest. You've got to join a queue of, you know, a thousand egos ahead of you before you'll even likely get to the top. Uh, in other words, we're now living in a world where there are very, very few places that will nurture our positive earth emotions. We seek them out. E.O. Wilson said something really great once, which was that we go to the ocean for, real, uh, for reasons we often can't put into, the, into words. And it's because we go there with this, this merging of the self and the world, it, it, there's, the horizon is at, at its largest. And so we now have to put into words those positive emotions because we're in a situation where we're losing them rapidly. And so I'd like to encourage your readers and listeners to think about their positive earth emotions and to add to them because I don't have a mortgage on them. I don't even... I'm not even claiming to have, have captured even a small slab of the uh, the spectrum of positive earth emotions. But all I know is that we need to name them now. We need to value them highly. And they're the basis for moving into the symbiocene. I even talk about a sum biography, which is the influences on you that produce uh, you as a person uh, a life-affirming person and what, what were the influences that 
that produced you the life-affirming, nature-loving type person. And that process itself could be a form of therapy where we rediscover or discover anew these positive emotions that we have with respect to uh, life, the earth, and all that. And so I want help in the uh, the discovery and rediscovery and spread of this whole domain of positive earth emotions. And it's got to be fast as well because the uh, the zombies uh, are getting larger and larger in number because muicide, the extinction of our emotions, is what most of our social media is really good at. Glenn Albrecht, thank you so much for letting us all inside of your ideas and your wonderful book, Earth Emotions. Please, everyone, go out and read it. Listen to this podcast and the beautiful conversation we had. And I'm so much looking forward for uh, you to find the time, the peace, and the collective help from everyone to get your book finished by the end of this year. And and we'll see that because I want to have you on the podcast again to talk about it. And I will devour it as soon as it comes out. And um, I'm so thankful for this time and uh, going into depth. Uh, it's a, it's not a given. And I, I appreciate the sacrifice you made to, to come in and speak to us all. Thank you so much, Glenn. Well, it was a pleasure, Mark. And good, good to meet a kindred spirit and, and resonate with you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. See you.